Hello, folks, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, today, we are honored to have two professors here, Professor Morgan Curry and Professor Peter Kaufman, to tell you a little bit about the art history and theory of architecture program we have running here at Carleton. Uh, my name is Gio, so if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to pop in the Q&A chat bubble. Um, should be located up on the top bar there for you to ask any questions. Um, I will be your host today, uh, but before we do get started, we do like to do just a little land acknowledgement. It is important uh, that Carleton recognizes that we are on the unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. So it is just important for us to recognize that before we jump into any presentations, because that is where all of our education and all of our learning takes place on that shared space. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Professor Kaufman to, to start our, our lovely presentation today. Thank you very much, Giovanna, and welcome to everybody. It's nice to have you here. I would say nice to see you, but of course I can't see you, but it's great uh, It's great to be able to make contact in this way. My name is Peter Kaufman, and uh, I'm an architectural historian. And as I think you know, uh, our department has two closely connected but distinct programs, art history and history and theory of architecture. I am the supervisor of the History and Theory of Architecture program. My colleague, Professor Morgan Curry, is the supervisor of uh, the Art History program. So you're actually going to see two presentations today, one on each of these programs. And as I think you'll see from the presentations, that there are some really useful and important linkages between the two, and they run along parallel roads. The presentations we have for you are in the form of pre-recorded videos that each of us did. So what we're going to do is we're going to run those videos, the History and Theory of Architecture one first, and followed by the Art History one, and then we will open it up for any questions you may have. And of course, immediately after we finish our session here, Morgan and I will be going into the uh, Art and Architectural History booth where you can join us again and ask more questions and discuss things in, in more detail than there will be time for here. So we're going to run the HTA video first, and uh, and then I may make one or two quick comments and pass, I'll pass this quick introduction to the History and Theory of Architecture program, or HTA as we call it for short. My name's Peter Kaufman, and I've been teaching the program since 2010. When you're considering university programs, you have to ask a lot of questions. I'm going to try to answer a few of the most important ones for you now. First, what is HTA? In short, it's a place to study the history of architecture. That is, we study history and the historical documents we're most concerned with are buildings. We look at how societies shape their architecture and how architecture shapes societies, at how people use buildings and how buildings affect people. This may seem a bit abstract, but in fact, architecture, probably more than any other art, has a huge impact on all of us every single day. The architecture we look at spans centuries, millennia in fact, as well as cultures. The specializations of our faculty range from medieval to 20th century Canadian to Turkish architecture of the Ottoman Empire. Our courses cover everything from prehistoric tombs to postmodernism. Pretty much anything that's part of our built environment is fair game for us. It's wonderful material to study, but why would you want to study it so intensively, to major in it? Broadly speaking, there are two answers to that question. One is that you want to work in one of the professions for which HTA is ideal preparation. You want a career in the field. The other answer is that you want to acquire the kinds of skills you get when you do a degree like HTA. Let's look at the careers first. A lot of students come to HTA because they want to be architects. Now, to become an accredited architect, you ultimately need a master's degree in architecture, an MArch as it's called. Before you do that master's, you need an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's degree. That undergraduate degree can of course be a Bachelor of Architecture, but it can also be a Bachelor of Arts, a BA in a discipline like HTA. Not only is that a viable path, arguably it's an even better one, as it gives you a whole set of research and communication skills that you wouldn't get with a BARC. Doing a BA 
followed by an MARC, gives you a really impressive arsenal of skills that will prepare you very well for the job market. More and more of our students are going into the urban planning field. And this is great news. Planners make a lot of critical decisions about our built environment, and to put it bluntly, most don't know nearly as much about architecture and history as they should. If the next generation of planners could all be HTA grads, our cities and towns could be better places, in my view. Many of our students decide to go into the heritage field, where they work on the management and maintenance of historic places. They may end up working for the government. Every level of government has heritage experts on staff. For example, Parks Canada is responsible for a huge number of heritage sites and properties across the country. Others work as independent heritage consultants or for private companies, including some architectural firms that specialize in managing or servicing historic properties. And there are other fields. Our students can become researchers or teachers and scholars or critics or communications professionals or go into any profession in which a well-trained mind is useful. Which segues perfectly to my second group of reasons why you might want to do an HTA degree. And that is because you want to acquire the skills that a good BA degree will teach you. It's a pretty long and impressive list which includes critical thinking, analytical thinking, creative thinking, creative problem solving, connecting disparate data, visual literacy, historical literacy, intellectual flexibility, written, oral, visual communication. I could go on, but I think you get the idea. These are skills that will serve you very well in any profession, skills that become a crucial part of what you bring to the table every time you go to work. Master these, and you'll set yourself apart in just about any professional setting. So, if you decide to take HDA, what will the experience be like? What are our classes like? They range widely in size, from about 250 for our first year surveys to about 15 or 20 for our fourth year seminars. Some are lecture courses, others revolve around class discussion. Most take place in the classroom, but some involve going out and looking at buildings together. In one of them, a fourth year seminar, students create virtual exhibitions for an online museum of architecture in the Ottawa area. At the beginning of your degree, you'll take mostly introductory courses and I want to give you a concrete sense of what they're like. Fortunately, because we've done so much online teaching lately, I don't have to give you a lecture simulation. I can show you an actual segment from an actual lecture in our first year survey of architecture. This clip discusses classical architecture, that is, the architecture of Greece and Rome from about 2,000 years ago, and the principles that underlie it. Don't worry if you don't understand all the architectural terminology. Remember, this was made for students who already had several weeks of study behind them. But this clip will give you a taste of some of the kinds of issues we discuss in first year. The topic is the classical ideal of good design and the rules that governed it. Here's the clip. Hello again. Welcome back. In the last video, we looked at the forms of classical architecture. To finish up this week, we're going to look at the principles of classicism, that is, the ideas and values that turn that collection of forms into a coherent, rational, and intelligible visual language. We're going to look at how to design a tetrastyle Doric temple, according to Vitruvius. You already know what Doric means. Tetrastyle means that the main facade has four columns, as you see here. Vitruvius tells us in great detail how such a facade should be designed. Here's how it works. We start with a square. This is our module. Vitruvius says, This module once fixed, all the parts of the work are adjusted by means of calculations based upon it. In other words, it doesn't matter how big or small the square is. What matters is that the rest of the design flow from this module. So we start with the base. And Vitruvius tells us that it should be 27 units wide. We then place a column at either end of the base. Vitruvius says they should be 2 modules wide and 14 modules high. 
We then place two more columns between them, centered eight modules apart. This leaves a space of five and a half modules between them and the outer columns. And that gives us a wider intercolumniation in the middle, which emphasizes bilateral symmetry and leaves a space for an entrance. And this may remind you of what we spoke about earlier when we talked about intercolumniation and how tightly controlled and important it was meant to be. The capitals, he tells us, should take up one module worth of height at the top of each column. And they should be two and one-sixth modules wide. Then comes the architrave, which should stretch across the full width and be one module high. We then place a triglyph centrally above each column. The triglyph should be one module wide and 1.5 modules high. We then put two more such triglyphs, evenly spaced between each of the outer pairs of columns, and three more between the middle pair. The space between the triglyphs we fill in with squares one and a half modules by one and a half modules. And these are, of course, the metopes. And then we add the pediment. There's a formula for this too, but I don't want to bog you down in detail, and by now I imagine you probably get the point. The point being that the modest little square module is the basis for every major dimension in this facade. Let's bring back the drawing we started with of the facade. And as you can see, it fits perfectly. All of the forms, the stuff we looked at in the last lecture, the flutes, entablature, metopes, the works, they're all subservient to an arrangement determined by the square module and the rules of good design, as laid out by Vitruvius. So you have the stylobate, the columns, the capitals, the entablature, and so on that we associate with classicism. And you also have the proportions, the discipline, the intellectual precision and clarity that are also fundamental to classicism. And they're all in the iron grip of this little square. Or as Vitruvius put it, propriety is that perfection of style which comes when a work is authoritatively constructed on approved principles. And these principles make a difference. If you have the forms, but not the principles, the body, but not the soul, to make an analogy, you don't have a fully classical building. Here's an example. Let's keep our classical ideal in sight, and let's compare it to this building that's right here in Ottawa. No one would claim that this is classical. It's symmetrical, yes, but its proportions are broad and low. There's no sense of modular design. It's really just a modern two-story block. And simply sticking classical forms on this non-classical building wouldn't change that. It wouldn't make it truly classical. And we know that because, in fact, this building has those forms. And as you can see, it doesn't really work. The detailing is quite precise. You've got capitals with bases and somewhat Doric-like columns with abaci. You've got architrave, frieze, cornice. It's all there. All the details are there. But the proportions are all wrong. The intercolumniation is ridiculous by Vitruvian standards. This shows us that putting classical icing on a non-classical cake doesn't give us the real thing. Next week, we'll look at some of the iconic buildings from this era. See you then. So that's what one of our first year intro course lectures might look like. We also have guest speakers come in from time to time, and lately we've been using a virtual equivalent of that by turning conversations with outside experts into podcasts. I want to play you an example from our second year course on medieval architecture. In this clip, architectural historian Dr. James Cameron joins us from England in a freewheeling discussion about how Gothic architecture continued to be imaginatively reinvented long after the end of the Middle Ages, right up to the present day, in fact. Even though the Middle Ages ended, Gothic never went away completely. The 18th century gave us Gothic literature and the start of the Gothic revival in architecture. Both gathered a lot more steam in the 19th century 
and even continued into the 20th. In the late 20th century, we got the goth subculture, its fashion, and its music. We even got a new musical genre, gothabilly. You got me crying like a child. So, is the poor historian of architecture and art just left on the sidelines? Not a chance, thanks to Dr. James Cameron. Because to all of this, he adds, Space Fleet Ecclesiastica. Well, actually, it um, comes from always an interest in comparing the sizes of buildings. If you scan all of the plans from a book like this, you can put them together and compare them with each other because they're all at the same scale. When I put them together, it's like, well, this is quite interesting as a wall chart thing. Why don't I just put them in in space? And I gave as a title for it, Battlefleet English Gothic. Now, uh, this did go moderately viral. One particularly gothic thing that uh, young people encounter these days, millennials anyway, the Harry Potter series is interesting. They use locations in that film, like Gloucester's Cloisters, Durham's Cloisters, other parts of Durham Cathedral. Indeed, Durham is used on the model for Hogwarts. You can pretty much see all of Durham Cathedral in the miniature. The way those films actually did reinvent Gothic for, um, you know, worldwide audience, you know, from America to um, Japan and that where it's popular, um, I think is, you know, is a fascinating sort of way that it continues to sort of spread that that visual sort of um, idiom about even more. So... There you have two examples taken from actual first and second year classes to give you a sense of what they're like. But I always say that a good education begins in the classroom, but it doesn't end there. So what goes on besides classes? There are a lot of answers to this. As often as possible, and when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, we go on field trips to look at architecture in the Ottawa area. It's a great way to get to know the city, the region, your classmates and your professors in an informal setting as we share our common passion for architecture. We also do everything we can to give our students a chance to study abroad. Not everyone can manage to do this, but for those who can, it's an unforgettable experience. We have agreements with several overseas universities that allow our students to spend a semester studying with them and their students to spend a semester with us in Ottawa. For HTA students, two particularly rewarding destinations for this have been Venice and Edinburgh, shown here. We also have shorter, more intensive courses offered by our own faculty during the spring or summer terms. On the left, you see a group of our students enjoying the sights of Rome, and on the right is a class that I took to England to study medieval architecture. These courses are very intensive and fairly short, usually two or three weeks, but count for a normal course credit. Another type of learning that's outside our usual classrooms is what we call the practicum. In a practicum, students spend eight hours per week over one semester working in an institution or an organization related to what we study and receive a course credit for doing so. It's a great way to see what it's actually like to work in this field and to enlarge your network of contacts. HTA students have done practicum placements in places ranging from Parks Canada to local architectural firms. The articles on the screen were written by one of our practicum students for the magazine Canada's History. Not too many students get bylines in a respected national magazine, and she credits this project for landing her her first job right after graduation and launching her on a successful career. Incidentally, she now works in communications for an architectural firm that specializes in revitalization of heritage sites. There are also a huge number of campus clubs, societies, and organizations that you can become involved with. It's a great way to meet people who share your passions and interests and make lifelong friends. 
This is the logo of the Carleton Art History Undergraduate Society, in which HTA is always very well represented. They organize everything from social outings to career consultations. It's a great place to start getting to know your peers. So there's a start. HTA is a degree, but it's also an experience, a combination of the things you learn, the people you meet, and the places you go, the sum total of everything you can squeeze out of your time at university. If you ever have any questions, never hesitate to contact me or one of my colleagues or our admin staff. We're here to help, to teach you, and to open doors for you. Okay, that uh, gives you an overview, I think, I hope, of the History and Theory of Architecture program. History and Theory of Architecture. I think I have the floor now. That gives you an overview of the program. And before I pass it on to Morgan, I'll just <clears throat> mention one other thing on the theme of careers that can follow from an HTA degree. Every year around this time, we actually have a panel discussion that we call what to do with your HTA degree. And in that panel, we invite some recent grads who are out working, who have, who are, who have got careers underway in different fields and ask them to talk to current, <clears throat> pardon me, current students about their career trajectory and how they got from being a student to the, the very successful careers that they're now in. And as it happens this year, it will be on Zoom because of course we're not doing a lot of in-person, large in-person gatherings yet. And it will be next Friday at one o'clock in the afternoon from one to two. So if that's something that interests you, I will put my email address in the chat. And if you want me to send you the Zoom link and password to our what to do with your HTA degree panel discussion next Friday, feel free to drop me a line and I'll send you the information. And you're certainly very, very welcome to join us and, 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 and see what these recent grads have to say and see the range of careers that, that grads in our program uh, end up entering. So I'll leave it at that for now. I say I'll put my email in the chat and I will pass it on to Morgan. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, that was uh, an enjoyable video as always. always. Um, I just wanna quickly say hi before I launch the art history presentation. I'm Morgan Curry. I'm uh, uh, Professor Kaufman's counterpart in the art history department. And what I have uh, queued up for you is a video that will build on um, more or less build on what, what he's presented. The one thing I will point out is that our two programs, Art History and the History and Theory of Architecture, uh, coexist within sort of one larger departmental structure, the uh, History of Art and Architecture. So uh, one of the wonderful things about Carleton is that, you know, we do have the resources that come from kind of two programs occupying uh, one spot. Anyhow, I don't want to take up too much time right now. So without further ado, let's start the art history video. As you can see from this first slide here, we are conveniently located on the Carleton campus in the St. Patrick's building, where we occupy a good portion of the fourth floor with some of our sibling programs that I'll be speaking about in a moment. The first source of information about the art history program at Carleton is our art history website. And as you can see here from the banner, the full name of our program is Art and Architectural History because we share the designation with the History and Theory of Architecture program as well. Oh. Now, art history is a curious discipline. It's not a new discipline by any means. Uh, its roots go back to the 19th century and even earlier in some ways, but it is curious because its name, as you can see from this slide, is actually composed of two different disciplines. You can study art, you can study history. So what does it mean to put them together? Well, art history began, as the name might suggest, as the history of art, studying what it means to make art, how art was made, how art was used, what art could represent, even what art looks like, who made art. All of these sorts of things would fall under art history. But over time, what happened, and it's not surprising when you think about it, because virtually every culture has made art in some capacity or another, what happened is that the discipline has grown into different areas that you can explore through it. 
And as you can see in this image here on the slide, and this is just showing a small sampling of sculpture and a little bit of architecture from around the world, I think the incredible variety of human art comes through. And because art is so ubiquitous, because art is so common in human cultures, virtually every time and place, you can explore almost any aspect of the human experience through art. And so over time, art history has come to incorporate a large number of different disciplines. And I've just listed a few of them here. You can think about art history in, in terms of history, in terms of the art itself, techniques and styles. Architecture, which is an important part of a visual culture. We use techniques of literary theory and adapt them to study imagery. Anthropology, obviously, which is the, the study of the human condition, human history, human civilization. Uh, issues of heritage, uh, aspects of philosophy and criticism, all the social sciences. I, I could go on, but I think this is sufficient to make the point, which is just that if something can exist culturally, it can be expressed through art. And one of the great attractions to art history, especially for somebody like me who still isn't entirely sure what he wants to be when he grows up, it means you don't have to limit yourself to one particular frame of reference or to one particular set of concerns. With art history, because you're studying the history of human expression, really, human visual expression, you can approach it from almost any angle that appeals to you. And here, just as a, a way of illustrating some of the variety that I just mentioned, uh, here's a, an Iwan, is the technical name of the, the structure, an Iwan from a 17th century mosque in Isfahan in Iran, which is just an example of the absolutely splendid tile work associated with the Safavid culture. But the skill set that you develop in art history, or you can develop in art history, is as broad as the range of approaches that you can take. You will learn critical thinking. You'll learn forms of analytical thinking, creative thinking and problem solving, uh, connecting data, all things that you would associate with any rigorous university degree. But we also add things that are more uniquely art historical as well, such as visual literacy. Because if you think about the study of history, you learn about the past through the study of old texts and some material culture. We learn how to read the images as well as the texts that accompany them. That leads into a broader form of historical literacy. It makes us very intellectually flexible because we have to be able to toggle from one form of expression to another. Written communication is obviously important to us because you have to share your ideas somehow. We could add oral communication and a visual communication also because when you're presenting an art historical presentation like I'm doing right now, you have to incorporate imagery as well. To give you an idea of the different approaches and competencies that can come into play when you're thinking art historically, let's look at a very famous image, and this would be Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, which he begins in the year 1503 and keeps with him for the rest of his life. He seems to work on it and tinker with it throughout his life. In some ways, it's sort of a laboratory for his painting ideas, but that's the history of the image. What I want to do, and since we don't have a, a huge amount of time, I want to focus on one famous aspect of this painting, and that's the expression. Let's zoom in and take a close look at the expression here. The famous uh, Mona Lisa smile, as it's sometimes referred to. The expression is part of the reason why the Mona Lisa has been so famous over the years. The painting almost seems to be awake. It almost seems to be able to respond to you. The expression seems almost alive. And that's not a random chance. You see, Leonardo da Vinci employed very specific techniques, drawing on different aspects of knowledge in order to create this effect. Now, the first and obvious thing to point out would be the use of shadowing. And if you'll notice, there's shadow around the corner of Mona Lisa's eyes, around the corner of her mouth. Now, when you're talking to somebody and you're trying to read their mood from their facial expression rather than just their words, if you're trying to get a read on what they're thinking or how they're feeling, the two most communicative parts of the face are the corner of the eyes and the corner of the mouth. And Leonardo puts both in shadow here so that you can't exactly see what the corner of her eyes or mouth are doing. That makes it difficult for you to actually nail down what her expression suggests, and as a result, it makes her seem sort of ambiguous or even mysterious. But there's even more to it than that. 
And this is an interesting insight into Leonardo's understanding of human physiology, but it also points to the different knowledge domains that come into play for art historical analysis. Bear with me for a moment while we take a quick look at the nature of the eye. Modern science has taught us that the way we see is based on the distribution of cells on the inside of the eye, here along the retina, in the back of the eye. And there's two primary kinds of cells that we use for seeing. Rod cells, which are evenly distributed around much of the retina, and cone cells, which are concentrated in an area called the fovea at the back of the retina. You see, light comes in through the eye, and the fovea is the area where our vision is most intensely focused. Well, the cone cells are how we see in high resolution. The cone cells are how we see in color. It's when we really stare closely at something, we put it right in that central point of our vision and bring our foveal vision, our cone cells, to bear on it. The rods, which are more spread out, we can't see in the same kind of resolution with them. We don't have the same color response, but we have a much wider range of vision, right? Because they cover the whole back of the retina. And that's where our peripheral vision comes in. Things that allow us to pick up on information in our broader environment that we don't necessarily have to see so clearly. If something's important, we can turn, look at it, and concentrate our cone cells. And here's a diagram that shows you what I just described here, right? So that foveal vision, the use of the cone cells, comes right up the middle. You can see it here. Here's a person's head that makes it even clearer. It comes right up the middle and gives us this very narrow area of focus. And then we have a peripheral vision that's much, much wider, but much less resolved. Now, why is this important? Well, first of all, Leonardo figured this out. He didn't know anything about cells. Cells hadn't been, well, the microscope hadn't even been discovered yet. But through observation and through reasoning, he figured out that this is more or less how the eye works. And we can see from his own diagrams from the late 1400s, where he kind of maps out the different resolution of vision and even comes up with something very, very close to a diagram of that focused foveal vision. In fact, we can put the two together and see how closely his diagram corresponds to what modern science tells us. So why is this important? Because it has to do with the way we visually process the face of the Mona Lisa. When we stare right at her, when we use those cones coming up the middle of our visual focus, we can clearly distinguish between the darker line of her mouth and the shadows around it. And from that perspective, she has a fairly even expression, maybe it's the slightest hint of a smile, but nothing that you would consider too emotionally demonstrative. Now, when you look at her through your peripheral vision, when you look at her with the rod cells only, the shadow seems more pronounced, and it becomes harder for you to separate out the mouth from the shadow around it. Let's uh, zoom in close and try this. If you turn your head to the side and look at her out of the corner of your eye with your peripheral vision, the shadow seems to become part of her mouth, and her smile becomes much more pronounced. When you turn and look at her square on, her expression seems to level out because the shadow just appears a shadow again. And so as your head turns to look at this painting, her mouth actually seems to smile as you look away from it. And that, just an optical trick, is the secret to the Mona Lisa smile. But to understand that optical trick, think of what we had to do. We need to know the painting itself, the history of the painting. We need to know a bit about Leonardo and his activities. And then we need the scientific knowledge to understand how the science of sight works. And that's just a nice way, I think, of introducing the breadth of art history, not just in terms of the skills that are needed, but in terms of the different areas of interest that you can take uh, in pursuing your own art historical studies. So let's have a look then at how this study of art history would be structured in the Carleton program. I've organized the program in a series of concentric circles with the program itself, when I use the abbreviation Art and Architectural History in the center, and just to refresh your memory, here are all those attributes that I had mentioned earlier. Now, Art and Architectural History is situated within a larger circle known as the School for Studies in Art and Culture, and here you can see the banner for the SSAC website as well. It's a larger organization within Carleton that contains four programs, Art History, 
history and theory of architecture, music and film studies. And this gives us the advantage of having the sort of weight and resources of a much larger department, even though art history itself is quite small, and which means you enjoy the benefits of a smaller program as well, lots of individual attention. Now, the School for Studies in Art and Culture is situated within Carleton University, which adds another layer of assets to the program. Those are the university level emphasis, like um, experiential learning, our focus on career development, the global perspective the university has, and the capital advantage. The outermost circle is the city of Ottawa, which, as you know, is the Canadian capital. And although Ottawa is a good-sized city, being in the capital means we have cultural resources at our disposal that are more extensive than you would expect for a city our size. Things like in the picture you can see right here, the National Gallery, for example, but also a variety of other galleries and cultural institutions as well. And so much in the same way that the SSAC gives the art history program the resources and reach of a larger program, the Capital Advantage gives Ottawa resources and reach of a larger city. And of course, I could add one more circle. Ottawa, as you know, is in the world itself, and Carleton does have a global perspective. It's a global perspective that's shared by the art history program, both in our courses and in our options for studying abroad or partnerships with other institutions as well. Now, how does art history work at Carleton? Well, let's take a look how art history is structured in the Carleton program. Again, the concentric circles will tell the story. The first year in our program is based around courses known as survey courses. These are large classes that introduce you to a broad survey, meaning a little bit of most everything of the history of art and the history of architecture from the ancient world or even the prehistoric world, as you can see here, all the way up into modern times. Obviously, a survey is sort of a cursory, quick overview, but it does give you a nice sense, a sort of a framework of how the history of visual culture works, and it allows you to then focus your interests as you progress through the program. And here is a graphic from the survey class that I teach. I'm using here the ancient Silk Road as a connective tissue to tie everything together and just gives you a sample of the wide range of images you can be exposed to in your first year. Second year, you start to focus in more. And here we have our second year classes where subject matter tends to focus more around specific areas. So this would be in the sort of image you might see in a course on Chinese painting. My second year courses I teach tend to focus on Renaissance Italy and the European 17th century. We also start to introduce an experiential learning component with our art live workshop to go along with these classes with a greater emphasis on time and place. And here you can see from the Art Live workshop is, like I say, an experiential learning course. Uh, he's one of our faculty, Professor Roy, with his class at the archives in the McCodrum Library. So they're actually getting their hands dirty, so to speak. They are getting their hands on them and starting to look under the hood and see how the knowledge that you study in the classroom is actually being produced. Third year, things become a little bit more focused still. We get into sort of a closer look. And this is where you'll have your methods classes. These are where you learn the technical aspects of art historical study. And here you can see an example of a methods class at the National Gallery. Under this here, it's being guest taught by one of the National Gallery curators. So that's your capital advantage at work, right? Not everybody has a National Gallery that they can go to and schedule a class. In fourth year, we move into more advanced research small-scale seminars, even some individual research, and I just thought it would be fun to throw in a picture of the Vatican archives there as a sort of uh, archetype for a primary source research. We have lots of archives here in Ottawa as well, where you can, if you're interested in doing that kind of primary source work, it can certainly be arranged. Here's an example of one of our fourth-year seminars taught by Professor Carrick, looking at the Carleton University Art Gallery's collection of paintings by an artist named Scotty Wilson. But it's just a nice illustration of having this sort of hands-on experience to complement your classroom learning. We also offer the opportunity for upper-level undergraduates to even present their research through things like our undergraduate symposium. And here you can see a, an old undergraduate symposium poster that I found in the process of organizing an undergraduate symposium for the beginning of April. Now, I can't mention experiential learning without mentioning our practicum program. And this is a four-credit placement 
in an area institution that covers a wide range of possibilities. I am currently serving as the practicum supervisor, so I'm involved in, in placing students who are in the practicum program. And we, I can tell you, we do our best to fit each student to a placement that best accommodates what they're interested in doing. And I've just included a number of places where we do place people. You can see here on the slide, we have the Ottawa Public Art Program, the National Gallery, the Ottawa Art Gallery, Heritage Canada, the architectural firms, uh, the Senate, libraries and archives, and so forth. The range of possibilities is as broad as the capital advantage will offer us. Now, on top of these for credit activities, we also have additional activities that allow you to take advantage of both Ottawa and the world around it. The pandemic has really put a, a damper on our ability to schedule things off campus. But as it appears the pandemic restrictions are beginning to wind down, you can look forward to these sort of trips and activities starting up again. And these are, of course, open to anyone in the art history or, for that matter, the HDA program. We also offer study abroad opportunities. Here I have some images from a study trip in England. I personally had been planning a study trip to Rome that was shelved when the pandemic came on, but this is something, all the groundwork has been done. As soon as Carlton clears us to travel again, this will definitely be on the table. So anybody who's coming into the program now will have that to look forward to in the next year or two. And we also have a program that we're partners uh, with the University of Warwick that offers us a few spaces in their full-term Venice program, where certain students are able to study uh, for Renaissance art and Italian culture for a semester in Venice. So these are just some of the study abroad opportunities that we offer that are part of that global focus in the Carleton program. Finally, I would have to mention our undergraduate society. CAHUS, the Carleton Art History Undergraduate Society, is very active. They organize a range of both practical and fun social activities. Here you can see examples of portfolio review and resume workshop for students who are thinking about life after their undergraduate, applying to other programs. They also organize parties and social events and things as well. So CAHUS is something I would strongly recommend that you get involved with. Now before I go, I should also mention life after art history in a little bit more detail. Art history graduates have the same opportunities that any graduate of a rigorous Bachelor of Arts program would have, with the addition of that visual literacy component I mentioned right at the beginning. And we have graduates who work in government, have gone on into architecture, in consulting, in teaching, research. We are very good at preparing you for graduate studies. We have students involved in graduate programs all over the world research positions, and, of course, design. Thank you for your attention. All right, it's coming back online. So that's uh, a quick look at the art history program. Um, we also have, just to sort of follow up on what uh, Professor Kaufman had said before we get into some questions, um, we also have a what to do with your art history degree program uh, coming up uh, a week from next Friday, so a week later. And since that will also be on a Zoom event, I think I will include the my email link in the chat in case uh, any of you are interested in listening in on that. Thank you. Yeah, actually, maybe I'll pick it up again just by answering a question that was placed in the chat by Oliver. And uh, the question asked me to comment on overlap and differences between program and Bachelor of Architectural Studies, which is in our School of Architecture or various other schools of architecture and history and theory of architecture, which we do. Uh, I'll start with the overlap, actually, because there, there is a certain amount of very precise overlap. For example, the first year survey course from which I I uh, plucked that segment of the lecture on, on Vitruvian Principles of Proportion. That's the first year core course for HTA. It's also a required first year course for students in the School of Architecture, as is the follow-up winter term course, which covers history of architecture from 1500 to the present. Those courses are common to both programs. Further on, there aren't any other school any other HTA courses the School of Architecture students have to take, although there are several that that they do take because there are, they fall among the School of Architecture's what they call up, approved electives, meaning they're courses you can take in partial fulfillment of your degree requirements that are not required courses. So there's a certain amount of overlap like that. 
Now, differences. The differences are significant and important. It's important for you to consider these if you're deciding which sort of program you want to go into. Because the fundamental difference is that a Bachelor of Architectural Studies is basically a design degree. And HTA, History and Theory of Architecture, is not a design degree. We don't train you in design, although there will be, there's the odd opportunity to, to work on designs as assignments in HTA courses. It is not a design degree. So they give you a very different skill set. As I mentioned in the, uh, in the video, if you want to be an accredited, ar accredited architect, you will have to do a Master's of Architecture after this, either way. So the question becomes, well, which sort of undergraduate degree do you want to have? Uh, something like a Bachelor of Architectural Studies or a BA in HTA. Now, <clears throat> I, I won't even pretend to be uh, an objective, disinterested observer here because, you know, HTA is it's, it's my baby. It's my, my professional home and I'm very heavily invested in the program. So, you know, please take what I say with a grain of salt. But for my money to do an undergrad in something like HTA, where you work on all sorts of skills, communi communication skills, research skills, and that sort of thing, and then to go on to an MR, where you get the intensive training in design, gives you a really fantastically broad skill set that is a huge professional asset. And, and to illustrate that, I remember I was talking to uh, one of the professors in uh, in the Art School of Architecture a while back about a guest speaker they'd brought in who was a successful Ottawa architect who'd come to speak to, to one of his classes. And he gave his presentation. And during the Q&A, one of the students uh, put up his hand and said, so, so if you're hiring a new employee, what's the most important skill you're looking for? And to the surprise of, I think, almost everybody in the room, the answer was literacy. I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? Because, of course, everyone applying for the job has an MR. They've all got the design chops. You know, they're all early in their career, so those design skills will need to be developed and, and, and so on, refined. <clears throat> but they all have that basic training. What he was saying is what sets you apart, if you want to work for us, is if you've got something besides those de design chops. You know, if you've got another skill set that is going to be useful to our company, if you've got a an additional skill set that is going to give us some sort of competitive advantage. So that was very, very interesting. And so to me, to get the sort of broad skills that we outlined actually in both videos, the same is true in art history, that sort of broad skill set and broad historical and architectural literacy based in all different centuries and different cultures in an HTA degree. degree. And then to add to that, the, the design skills that you would get in the MARC, to me, that gives you the best possible combination of skills. But as I say, don't think for a moment I'm a, an objective observer of this because I'm the HTA guy, right? For what it's worth, if you are free next Friday afternoon for an hour to come to our uh, What to Do With Your H degree, HTA Degrees um, workshop, one of our panelists will be somebody who followed exactly that path. He did his BA in HTA, then went on to do a, a Master's of Architecture and is now an intern architect for uh, an Ottawa architectural firm. So he's followed that trajectory exactly. So there's someone you can ask very specifically, well, are you glad you did it that way instead of the other way? What were the advantages of doing it that way rather than the other way? Were there any disadvantages, do you think, to doing it that way rather than the other way? So you can get it straight from the horse's mouth from someone who isn't as invested in HTA as I am. So if you're able to come to that, I would encourage you to do so. If you're not able to come to that, uh, drop me a line and I'm, I'm sure he'd agree to let me put you in touch with him if that works for you. And also, hopefully this summer, I'm going to interview a bunch more graduates, get them to talk about their career trajectories and turn it into a podcast. We'll just stick on our departmental website and it will be permanently there. Uh, but any one of those avenues will be open to you if you want to get um, uh, an answer straight from the horse's mouth. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, if not, feel free to ask a supplementary question or, or ask either Morgan or myself uh, anything you like. I would just sort of jump in at the end of that as well. Um, I'm obviously not, I'm not the HTA guy, but I do teach some in HTA, in the HTA program. And I've written a lot of letters of reference for HTA students who are applying to Masters of Architecture programs. And I can 
like speaking from that perspective, um, I can tell you that they do very well in terms of admissions. Um, I don't see any real um, anything that sort of holds them back there. And when I hear back from them, they all seem to be very grateful to have had that kind of background um, in the hist history and theory that their uh, masters of architecture classmates don't have. Uh, I see another question just came came up. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know if it is required to get my BAS to be able to get a master's in architecture, or can we just go? You can go straight from HTA yeah. to MARC. Uh, you now, what you have to do is you have to go. There are a certain number of universe schools of architecture across the country that have MARC programs for students who have BAs instead of M instead of BARCs, so or BAS degrees. So you have to pick one of those schools that has the right program for you. But as long as you do that, then yes, you go straight from your HTA Bachelor of Arts into a Master's of Architecture program. We have one of those Master's programs here at Carleton. There's also one at U of T, there's one at U Calgary, there's one at UBC, I think at Dalhousie. I'm just going through, you know, like Morgan, I, I, I write a lot of letters of reference uh, every year for, for our graduates who plan to do that. So I'm just sort of going through in my memory the various universities to which I've sent those letters of reference. So um, those are the ones that come to mind right a lot away. Of Amer so a lot of American programs too. Yeah, okay, American programs too. I'm not as familiar with those uh, personally, but yeah. So so yes, uh, there are MARC degrees designed for students who don't have bachelor's degrees from a school of architecture. So you just apply to one of those. And as Morgan said, we, we've had, our students have had a lot of success getting into those. I, I should point out if there's one disadvantage to that, it's that those MR programs are usually a bit longer. They're usually three years rather than two. So there's that trade-off, you know, to my mind, you know, I can promise you by the time you're my age, you won't even remember that you spent that extra year doing your MR. And to me, the trade-off of adding that extra year to the whole grand scheme of things versus the very, very wide range of skills that you emerge with, to me, that's nothing. You know, to me, that's a, 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 an excellent deal to, to, to spend that extra year doing your master's in order to graduate from your master's with a resume and a CV and stuff you've produced that covers a much, much wider range of useful skills than, than a lot of the people with whom you'll frankly be competing to get jobs. Well, it makes you more versatile and more employable on the job market too. Yep, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Actually, I'll just add as well, a lot of our students come into HT and that is their plan and that is what they do. They do their BA and then they go into an MARC as, as this guy in the panel did. On the other hand, a lot of our students come into the program thinking that's what they're going to do. And as they take a bunch of courses, they start becoming interested in other things and realizing that the world of architecture includes a lot of careers other than simply being an architect. And they go off into those directions as well. So I'll just mention one, we've got three panelists at this thing next week. One of them is uh, an intern architect who did his BA and his MARC. Another is someone who did her BA and actually went straight into her career from a BA and is working as creative director in an architectural firm, not as a designer, but more from the communications end. And she's working for an architectural firm that specializes in historical and heritage uh, restoration projects and that sort of thing. So she's working in the field of professional architecture, but not as an architect. And the third person on our panel is actually, uh, uh, she did her BA in HTA, then went on to do a master's degree in planning at Dalhousie University, and is now working as a heritage planner for the province of British Columbia. So we've got someone who's an architect, Someone who's working in an architectural firm, but not as a designer, and someone who's working as a planner. So already three very, very, very different career directions, all very firmly grounded in the HTA degree. So by all means, you know, have your goal, you know, know what you're after and that sort of thing. But also I encourage students just starting the program to be open and to realize that the world of architecture is actually professionally speaking a really big really diverse world and being the person who sits down at the drafting table is not the only role and it's not it may 
be the role for you, or you may find there are other roles that are actually better suited to you and more exciting and more interesting to you. So it's it's good to be open to that. Just looking at a question from Elijah here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, that, uh, uh, post baccalaureate degree in accounting is not something that we can answer in this session. Mm. Uh, I, I'd refer you, I think, to the registrar's office, perhaps, <clears throat> unless uh, uh, Morgan or Giovanna has a, a better suggestion for that. Does um, that business or Sprott, like Sprott, some, that would oh, be yes, administered, yeah. I would I think, through uh, yeah. business administration. Yeah. The registrar's office would be the person who could give you the most um, definitive, like just send you where to go to someone who could actually help you. How do we, we do have a few minutes left if there are any more questions. And of course, keep in mind, as soon as we wind up here, uh, we will go into our... Uh, I don't have the contact information of the registrar at my fingertips, but if you go to the Carlton website, uh, and actually, I think Morgan's advice was better than mine, frankly. If you go to the Carleton website and look up the School of Business, then uh, then uh, there, will, there will be contact information there, I think. Yeah. Ah, good. Thank you, Giovanna. Yes, yes, good. So the, I thought they must have a session. I just didn't have any of that data at my fingertips. Thank you. So yes, uh, we are going to go straight into the... Uh, the booth where you can come in, uh, you come in, I, you actually have to pick a seat at the table. <laughs> it's a virtual table, but uh, Morgan and I will both be at the virtual table and we will be sitting there and ready to chat if you want to talk about any any of you know, this or uh, uh, any other questions that haven't come up, anything to do with either of our programs, we'll be happy to give you any help we can in that booth. Uh, I see we have about, I don't know, about two and a half minutes left now if anyone wants to take a, ah, another link for admissions. Thank you, Giovanna. Uh, yeah, we have about two minutes left now if anyone wants to ask any other quick questions before we adjourn to uh, to the booth. Feel free to bring a coffee to the booth. I'm sorry I can't uh, buy you one myself, but uh, I've got my tea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much for all that info today. I really, really enjoyed those videos. I, I was saying I was like kind of going like this behind my screen to see if the Mona Lisa was following me. Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, they will be open at the booth if you have any questions uh, for them there. We do have other sessions going on today as well as other booths. If you have questions for student services or things like that, I encourage you to hop over there. But Without further ado, I think uh, we're going to wrap up here as uh, so you have that time to pop into those booth sessions. Thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Go uh, take a look at around uh, the, the booths and the, and the live sessions we have. Bye, folks. Thank you all. Thanks, Joe. Take care.